the policies. What we've done in the report is just to show, uh, and that's my colleague uh, Andras Baldi from uh, from the IPDS uh, in this, uh, who, who has participated to this report. He says, based on science, we can quite well define the limits, the planetary, translate the planetary boundaries to the scale of the EU food system and show what are the uh, end of the period targets, 2050 targets for the European food systems in terms of uh, CO2 reduction, nitrogen or phosphorus reduction, uh, the uh, way that we um, appropriate human appropriation of uh, net primary production, how that all these need to be reduced. And you can look also at the reduction of pesticides that is quite radical. Uh, and that's very much in line with what the Green Deal has been defined, uh, uh, has been defining. Uh, if you look at um, uh, President von der Leyen's uh, objectives for the Green Deal, it's about carbon neutrality, it's about biodiversity protection, it's about zero, uh, zero pollution, uh, and it's about full circularity. So this is how, this is where we want to be. And, and as Mrs. von der Leyen was saying, this is the man to the moon moment for Europe. And that's particularly true for the food system in Europe and how it inter also how the food system in Europe uh, interacts with the uh, the food system globally, but these we can easily show what are the uh, planetary boundaries, what are the objectives in terms of environmental performance of the food system in twenty in twenty fifty, um, and we can also understand, uh, but that is something that we have done on a more qualitative way. What would be uh, the, the 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 social and justice objectives in terms of the transformation of the food systems, which means equal access for all to healthy and sustainable nutrition, no discriminations, and in particular, no gender discriminations. In terms of equal remuneration, the farmers in Europe are among the, 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 the workers that, uh, that, that have uh, the, 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 the lowest remuneration, uh, despite uh, the, the common agricultural policy. Uh, there, is also, there are also issues about not just humans, but also uh, animal welfare. And there are issues that are about um, also accessing uh, a, a series of services like the internet to ensure that there is equality. So these are just examples, I would say, of how to define what is the safe and just operating space. And the big question is now, how do we get there? Uh, and one of the things that we've done in this report is to say, we see the goal. Uh, there might be some divergences about how to define this goal. Uh, but the most important is now to discuss the pathways. How do we get there? And we've tried to illustrate that there are at least three entry points, three pathways to, uh, to go to, to, to get to the, this safe and just operating space for the EU food system. And these are expressed in terms of processes in order to understand what is the blocking factor or what can be the accelerating factors for these processes to happen. Um, these, again, these three pathways have been elaborated by looking at research, but also through uh, um, uh, foresight workshops with stakeholders, so there might be others, but I think these three are really very illustrative of the main problems and the main avenues we have for the transformation. Let's have a, a short look at them. Um, one of them is about uh, recircular, recircularizing uh, the bio, the bioeconomy. So getting to full circularity means that we need to transition for from systems that are currently uh, based on specialization in regions, in, in production areas that are special, specializing. The, tr the trend is about special, continued specialization of, the, of these regions. And if we want to, to, to make a circular bioeconomy that is respectful of the carrying capacity of the regional ecosystems, that means that we need to look for much more uh, um, uh, a variety of supply chains that would be developing on the same production basin and interacting with one another, the bioproducts of one being the, uh, the, uh, the inputs of another. And that means that we need to think of a, 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 a very diversified, um, regionally organized cluster for bioeconomy to, to, to exist. And, and that shift from a specializing trend to the recircularization is something that is very um, uh, asking for a lot of innovations uh, in order to make it happen, both in terms of uh, process and technological innovation in the food industry, in the bioeconomy industry, but also uh, about the, the business model that makes it uh, that makes it happen. That is related to the other uh, pathway and very related to the other pathway that is 
and that has been quite reinforced by the, the, the COVID crisis in, in the, the strength that this can have in terms of convincing economic decision makers. Um, if we want to reach that safe and just operating space, we need to recomplexify our agricultural landscapes. We need to re-diversify our crop rotations, recomplexify uh, the crop rotations to introduce legumes, for instance, to make uh, to better store carbon in soil, but also to reduce the, the level of uh, uh, um, chemical inputs uh, in terms of fertilizers that are put into the uh, on, on, on agriculture. But it's also re-diversifying diets, accepting the heterogeneity of diets, but also the diversity within one specific uh, diet. Um, and so we, we, what we make in this report is to say, we need to, uh, th there are lots of reasons why diversity means extra costs, but it's also one of the uh, uh, necessary uh, conditions for sustainability, for environmental sustainability, and to some extent also for nutrition. And diversity is actually also a good factor of resilience. So there are many reasons why we believe re-diversifying, uh, which is in stark contrast with what's ha been happening in the last 40 years or 50 years in Europe, in all production regions, re-diversifying the production regions, the socioeconomic, also re-diversifying the, the scale of our socioeconomic businesses. This is uh, probably something that is going to be extremely important for, for uh, getting into or staying within uh, the safe and just operating space for the food system. So this can be discussed, but I think the, 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 the issue that re-diversification matters, uh, at least in the agricultural sector, any diets, that stands. And that's quite under, uh, one of the key questions that is asked is to what extent uh, can that be uh, made, how can we bifurcate from a trend towards more specialization towards re-diversification. And the last process, process is about how do we ensure that the diets, uh, instead of a trend that is towards uh, um, unhealthy or nutritionally not, uh, not well-balanced diets, how can we ensure that uh, all Europeans and, if possible, all, all humans on, on the planet uh, are given access to a healthy and sustainable diet? So this change in pathway is also something that we've been looking at. Now, um, the thing that... Um, um, the thing that, that is extremely uh, important, uh, and I will not get into details, in, in, but in that report, what we, what we are pinpointing is that there are critical transition questions that open up avenues for innovation, but it's also about problems for innovation or questions to innovation in order to overcome these barriers. And I just, this is not a, an exhaustive list, but I think these, this list is quite illustrative of the types of questions that can be asked if you look at the pathway and not just at the end of the period. The first and foremost, the, the most important question is about, can we more accurately identify the barriers to change and uh, always have in mind the, 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 the idea of a distributive impact of the change we want to, to see? That means uh, potential winners and losers. Who's, who's going to lose from the transition, from the change we want to trigger? Because these are the people who are going to either resist change or be uh, socially uh, impacted in terms of uh, loss of welfare. Uh, for, and, and we need to think of not only compensation, but the political strategy that can enable uh, them to be on board of the transformation. Uh, and I just, I'm, I'm, gonna just, I, I'm just going to pinpoint some of the questions that we've been asking in this report. Um, we've, we've been looking at, of course, changes in consumer behavior, but not just individual uh, uh, behavioral changes and nudge, but really at the food environment and how that structures through social norms, through market, uh, the, 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 the scope of what is on the market, many things that are structural uh, factors that structure the food, food environment and constrain or open up the possibility for change in diets. Um, and that's, I think, very important to, to balance individual behavior and structural uh, factors. And, and that's uh, probably at, uh, within the researchers within the HDHL, this is something uh, quite, quite a common understanding, but that was very important. Um, there, there we also, uh, we are, we, we've also been looking at uh, the role of policies uh, to trigger change, but also that the need for repurposing subsidies, and in particular the, the subsidies from the Common Agricultural Policy, to make them a factor 
to trigger change rather than a factor to continue statu quo. And we've been also looking at the, 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 the increasing role of cities uh, and, and innovations in governance at regional scale, how to foster this governance in, in cluster. Um, so the report uh, that, I, that, that I have been mentioning is a report, uh, a foresight expert uh, group report to the Standing Committee on Agricultural Research called um, uh, um, Resilience and Transformation. Um, the the other thing that I, that I, that, I, that we use you can see that I want to, to uh, illustrate based on the on the on the on, on what is in, in this report is that um, we will need um, to, to to if we want um, innovative business models for for a re-diversified bioeconomy to emerge this will need innovative business models and also sufficiency oriented business models and not just uh, productivity oriented business models. If we want to change diets, that means that we will need to have uh, something about uh, how can we sell less and make more value, more more prosperity for uh, workers, for the businesses, and for society overall. So, how this sufficiency issue is something that is extremely important, and that raises a lot of questions about is that compatible with the way competition is organized in the supply chain and in the, in, the, in the common market and in the food system in general. Another big question or big problem that we have been looking at is we will need business models based on re-diversification, resilience, economies of synergies, economies of scope, rather than what we have been experiencing for the moment, which is around economies of scale, massification, and standardization. So re-heterogenizing uh, the bioeconomy and the food economy is something that is quite contradictory with the current trends, but there are business models that do exist. How do we ensure that in the competition between these business models, massification and economies of scale is not the only law that prevails, but that there are other economic strategies, business strategies that can, that can be uh, looked at. And of course, that necessitates also financial innovation, not just to uh, try and, and uh, um, uh, remunerate ecosystem services, but really to look at the transition period where there might be extra cost to change, to transition, and, and therefore uh, triggering transition is about maybe enabling uh, financial innovation to, to, to come up for that purpose. The last thing that I think is very important for, for uh, uh, the GPI HDHL research community is that if we want to make these change, uh, we probably need to face the fact that um, we've been ensuring to some extent easy access to calories by ensuring that food is always sold as a lower price. So this downward trend, downward trend on prices for food has been occurring in, in Europe for the last 50 years. And to some extent, it was the basics of competition on the inner market saying, if the consumer has lower prices on food, it's prosperity for all. And that has been at the basis of why some of the farmers could not transition because they are not well remunerated for the food that they produce. So if we stop that, if we, if we accept that prices need for food need to be uh, to, to, to stop getting down or at least or even to increase that is going to ask a lot of questions about accessibility affordability of food but that and I saw that in the French uh, citizens convention on climate the citizens the 150 citizens in that convention were asking maybe we need to have a social security social uh, food social security and to rethink completely how we ensure access to food for the poorest in our societies not just through the fact that they would access calories or even empty calories at the always lower prices. We need to ensure that there is access to nutrition and food security for these people. So I see that I'm talking too much already, um, and, and I want to, to leave some space for, for questions. So I, I've just tried to, to, tell, to tell you, these are the types of questions that are both at the scale of uh, technical innovation, financial innovation, policy innovation, business model innovation, and also social organization innovation that we need to have if we want to make the food system the, the transformation. But of course, policy has a specific role to play there. And there is an interaction between science, the progress in science and innovation, the, 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 the evolution of policies, and how the food system is transforming. And some part of it is how can science feed policy and the development of policy to better to have policies that, that, that really are able to make the, the change we need uh, and to trigger transformation in the food system. One point that I want to, to pinpoint in, the, in, the, in this, um, this last part of my, of my presentation is really the fact that let's not only think 
of new policies being developed, but really about policy change. What needs to change? What needs to change in our policies if we want the food system to transform? And what role can science play in that regard? Um, and and for, for that to be, uh, for, for you to think about it, I think it's very important to, to understand that very often uh, uh, researchers uh, are very worried about their relation to policymakers. And we, I think we, it's true that we need to improve our uh, communications or the way researchers interact with policymaking. But this is really a collective action problem. Uh, how can we have policymaking uh, that changes, uh, the, 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 what type of policymaking is needed to, uh, to, uh, to change the food system and how can science contribute to that? And I, I, so th this is just a, a poll uh, to you in the audience to see what is to you the most important obstacle to science's impact on policies or to science's impact for the transformation that we need. And I'd be really happy if you would like to, uh, to, uh, to participate to this poll, just to see how, uh, if you think it's uh, the relevance of science messages that is not well designed and we need to be more relevant to better impact policy making. Is that a problem of communication that our messages are not well formulated and that they need to be formulated in the words of the decision makers. Um, so please, while I'm speaking these options out, don't hesitate to already uh, vote for them. You can vote on your screen. Um, is it a problem of timeliness that uh, the temporality of science is long and that uh, results arrive once decisions is already, are already taken? So do we need to improve timeliness? Um, is the problem, the major problem, the idea that um, we need to uh, think of communicating not just to one player but to all players and that the problem is that they have insufficient information that, that if they would be better informed they would make the decision to make the transition or is the idea that actually uh, players are not able to negotiate with one another that they, they, don't, they can't decide collectively the, the, these, uh, these actors because there is um, in, insufficient coordination and we would be with science bridging this gap and bringing uh, information and thus coordination between the players. And of course, you could be saying th there is another uh, thing that I would like to say, but and so I, yeah, you don't agree with my uh, these first uh, uh, possibilities of the poll. Um, so I see most of you uh, really looking at the idea that uh, what we need, what what we, we would need uh, to to trigger transformation is that. Um, there is a lack of coordination between the players and if we would be able with science to bridge the gap then the transition would be would be happening uh, so thanks for those who have been participating to the poll i think the idea is not just to 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 look at what is the the the, the real answer uh, and and so so i see the majority is really about that of course there are issues of timeliness and and communicability uh, some people uh, think it's about relevance, but some people are also not satisfied with the the five the first five, five the first five options. So maybe I will I will get back. To, thanks a lot for that. I will get back to the the presentation and thanks to C for helping me out with that. Um, basically, what where I, where I want to come to is that um, I would have voted for others. So this is really mean from from my side to have opened up options that are not sufficient, and I would have voted for. There is another issue. Um, so basically, um, I think very often when we researchers think about what we need to do to, 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 to impact policy making in order to impact transformation of the food system, is that we think uh, either that the policy maker is just one person, one, one unique decision maker. And I think all of you said, no, it's actually a problem. It's a collective action problem. And so we need to look at the fact that policy making is a political process where there are many players that need to decide jointly. But on top of it, um, one of the things that I think is really important is that uh, very often uh, the, the, the collective action problem is presented as if the problem was a, a problem of insufficient information. And I just want to insist that personally, I've seen so many cases where actually the information was more than sufficient, but uh, the uncertainties was, were strategically used by some of the players to justify their inaction or their incapacity or their, their, that it was not legitimate to push for more, uh, more ambitious transformation. So basically what I want to convey here is that 
uh, in the moment where we are, where we have already a lot of information about where we need to be in 2050 to be sustainable, and what are the pos some of the potential pathways or the building blocks of what is blocking action, science cannot avoid looking at the fact that science will play a strategic role to uh, unlock uh, the decision-making process that is going to be a, a completely a political decision-making process where some of the players are organized in a coalition for statu quo, while others are organized in a coalition for change. And this is, the, from my understanding, one of the, the, the possibilities <clears throat> that I propose to you of how to look at the policy-making process. If you look at it in that regard, as a political negotiation process between interest groups, then definitely science cannot avoid looking at its strategic role to unlock transformation. Of course, if you want to intervene as a researcher in such a ne political negotiation process, where what matters is politics, the political economy for change, then transparency is going to be very critical. What is your normative standpoint? What is it that you want to achieve? Why, well, you can say my standpoint is that I'm, I'm looking at research that will enable to transform to uh, staying within the, the safe and just operating space. Um, but of course, <clears throat> that makes it uh, very important to understand that uh, sometimes uh, uh, you, you might be compared as an activist if you do that way, if you, if you accept that you have an normative standpoint. And that's, of course, very important to really specify that there is a specific space and role for science compared to other interest groups in that negotiation process. Last point, policies themselves can be the blocking factor. And I, I mean, for Europeans, it's now quite clear that the common agricultural policy as such is one of the things that is very difficult to be reformed. Um, many of the, the scholars like uh, Johann Swinnen from Leuven and others have been just showing with the, the example of the reform of 2013 of the CAP, that the CAP is unreformable, that you can't change something where member states want to have their money back for their own farmers. And that in the end, the reform process is something that is going to be extremely difficult. So science can have a specific role to inform policy, but also to question policy, to question statu quo arbitrages, and also to question existing policy framings. And for instance, to say what we need is a common food policy and not a common agricultural policy. Um, so I see that I'm already, I've already been talking a lot. Just to, to, to tell you that, um, uh, sorry, I've, I've been too, too rapidly jumping from one slide to the other. Um, there is this very uh, useful framework developed by Hills and Schott in 2007 that talks about the fact that we are locked in into a socio-technical regime and that we, what we need to do is to unlock this regime for, for niche innovations to be able to interfere, reconfigurate these, uh, this socio-technical regime. But among the regime dimensions, you have the policy making and you have policies such as the, the CAP, but also the competition policy that I've been, for instance, uh, uh, presenting as one of the key elements we've been pinpointing as one of the policies, and in particular, the way that the, the competition policy is implemented, interpreted uh, in some of the specific decisions, that is probably blocking um, the emergence of transformative business models in the, bio in the bioeconomy and in the food system. Um, I think I, I will probably uh, go more rapidly on some of the things that I had prepared, but just to say that um, it's true that we need to uh, interact better with, this, with the, the, the policy makers and that we uh, as researchers need to have a better culture of what policy making is. Um, for scientists, it's important to understand that policy making is actually a political negotiation process, that there is a whole political economy and the play, be an interplay between players and, 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 and with uh, asymmetrical power balances. Uh, and that is what makes public decision. Uh, if we want public decision to happen for change, we need to see how our science is probably going to interfere with the balance of power, uh, because that's probably that what's going to happen. So there is a, 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 an impact of our science on the balance of power, reinforcing the, the coalition for statu quo or giving more uh, room for maneuver for the coalition for change. And this is something we probably need to accept um, and, and uh, nevertheless, we cannot substitute to democratic political decision making. That is not uh, incoherent. And on the other hand, of course, political actors need to understand that there are scientific statements that are, are from an imperative nature, what, that we need to stay within the boundaries of the, we need within the planetary boundaries. This is something that is just 
a fact if we don't want to tip over to a very dangerous future. But that does not uh, prevent that within science, there are also inherent controversies uh, and that we need also to see that uh, in economics, for instance, or in sociology, you have different schools of thoughts that need to have these controversies to feed decision making. And this is not contradictory. So that's uh, better, the, the better understanding, a better culture of what science is for political actors and what political decision making is for scientists is, I, I think, very, very important. Um, um, last thing I think that I wanted to, to convey to you is, of course, that we should not just think of science and policy, but science, society and policy. And of course, um, there is the impo very important role of the media, the social media in particular. If we want one of the roles for science to really trigger change is when we are able to, um, to, to, to set new items on the, on the political agenda. And if we want to do that, of course, policy making rests, setting something on the political agenda rests on the existence of a public uh, for, for a collective problem. And so we can't think of agenda setting, a new problem to be set on the agenda, and for instance, saying we need a common food policy. If we only interact with policy makers, we probably need to see how that needs and necessitates that scientists also talk to the wider public. Um, and of course, we also have a lot of uh, interesting experiments of science in society, participatory research and participation also for policy making. So specific uh, dedicated mechanisms for participation within science, within policy making, or jointly with science and policy making can also be very, very important uh, devices. So I think I stopped there. Uh, my main point was really to tell you, um, we need to really think of the pathways for change. And if we are serious about the pathways for change, this is going to make the role of science extremely political. We need to think about it, accept it, but also look at how we can navigate that and be one of the uh, actors that uh, enables the transition for, towards uh, the transformation, to trigger the transformation towards a sustainable food system. Thank you very much for your attention, and please, I, I would be really happy to, to uh, answer some of the questions that you've asked in the chat, but for the moment, I haven't been able to look at them. Hi, Sebastian. Hi, Sebastian. I hope you can hear me now. Um, uh, I think, thank you very much for this very interesting talk. And I think uh, even if you look at the corona crisis right now and you see how science, uh, you know, affects policy kind of, you know, straight away and the importance of science is in this whole pandemic issue, uh, I think is it is not what we, of course, want, but it is how science and policy can actually influence each other and how science is also valued. Um, you know, by policy makers. Um, so, uh, yeah, well, thanks a lot for your talk. And there were some questions uh, in the chat, um, which uh, I think you can now also scroll to, but with, which is, of course, always very difficult when you're giving a presentation to also follow that. Uh, but uh, there was a little bit of debate between two of our participants, uh, Paula Varela Tomasco and Edward Slavinsky, uh, which is primarily uh, focused at uh, uh, how to drive both healthy diets and sustainability together in the food system uh, because, uh, well, uh, Paula kind of says that the focus on uh, sustainability doesn't necessarily mean that that will result in a healthy diet. Uh, uh, so uh, do you have any ideas on that? So I haven't been able to really see what is the controversy, but I think this is extremely important uh, what I see from Paula Varela's uh, message is I, I completely concur with the fact that uh, there, there is currently a lot of emphasis on the climate positive or biodiversity positive uh, agriculture and food that could be extremely compatible with the trends towards uh, more processed foods. Um, and, and I think that seems quite possible for the climate uh, objective. If you look at biodiversity, suddenly it becomes much more complicated. So I'm, I'm still uh, thinking, because I'm working in a think tank that particularly insists on the uh, environmental performance of what we try to achieve, that biodiversity uh, that is inherent to the, the European Green Deal is going to be a key wedge to really discuss uh, existing trends in the food processing industry and how they see the future of innovation and formulation of new products. Um, but of course, this is not. This is just a kind of a bet from my side, and I believe it's extremely important to really look at 
healthy and sustainable diets because then healthy and sustainable food systems because then really you are there is a necessity to really look and, and to question the current business model in the in the food industry um, there I, I remember already 10 years ago my colleague louis georges solaire from uh, inrae uh, published a paper where he was showing that the the food industry had been segmented. I mean, that's a very general statement, and we know that meat, dairy, uh, vegetable products is quite different. But this general statement, I think, is really important. He's saying the trend of the food industry has been to segmentate. You have upstream players in the food industry that are disaggregating agricultural raw materials to make them to 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 make them in uh, small elements, and then there is a second segment that reaggregates into something that is completely different and completely untraceable. To the initial raw materials and that trend is actually the problem both mm -hmm. for health and nutrition on one hand and for sustainability on the other hand and we need to try and, and look at business models that would question that segmentation the problem yeah. is that this is what made the food industry extremely profitable <laughs> and, and because it enabled also to concentrate the value proposition at the a downstream part of the of the food value chain and that's really why i was insisting so much on innovation in the business model uh, mm -hmm. of the food industry which is very important for hdhl and even innovation in the business model that are linked with the organization of the food supply chain and also linked to the process innovation so it's technical business model marketing innovations that are the things that we need to question and I think that also connects to uh, a question of uh, one of the other members of the uh, audience, uh, Thomas uh, Meronio, I hope I pronounce it well, who says, uh, will big company, companies accept the shift needed for a more sustainable business model? And I think it, it really depends on what's in there for them. I mean, of course, in the end, uh, profit is, uh, is a, a major driver for big companies. And, uh, you know, what is the business model for, uh, you know, to, to really look at sustainable and healthy foods, I guess? Yeah, I, I mean, this is really um, uh, what I was trying to say is exactly uh, what, what uh, Thomas is asking, that, that we have been resting on a trend that, made, that has made the profitability of the food industry that we probably need to reverse. Uh, and this is also linked to what I've been saying, that if we are really serious about diversity, I mean, we, we, we strongly advocate in the SCAR report for re-diversification being a necessity for sustainability and nutrition. This is still something that, I mean, we don't have a lot of literature behind that. So this might still be questioned. But if you believe us, if you, if you, if you are stay on that side, that is extremely questioning the business model of the, of the, of the large transnational companies that rely mainly on, on the... Uh, uh, economies of scale and mass production. So, nevertheless, economies of scale is not a law of nature. Uh, this is something I want to say. I mean, it's a very strong uh, statement, economic strategy, very strong economic strategy in an open market globally. But there are, in, in business literature, you find other business models that are around the economies of scope, where what you look at is the synergies of a variety, of, of a diversity of supply chains that you have interact with one another. So there are some things that we can we, we can transition. The only thing that I probably would like to question is the fact that if you look at how Paul Polman, uh, when he tried to, to, to make important changes at Unilever, he was quite, um, I mean, he was questioned, challenged quite a lot by the shareholders. Again, recently, um, Emmanuel Faber in Danone uh, oriented some, something around Danone uh, looking at diversification as a, one of the key issues, and there are probably many other things that were uh, a problem between him and his board. But the shareholders again challenged that vision of what would be what would be innovation, and and those who were leading the fight were actually saying what we need to come back to is ultra processed dairy products with uh, uh, added uh, nutri added the nutritional uh, allegations. So, so you see, really, to me the formulation of products of the past of, of the world before and not of the world of tomorrow but that's my own normative statement you don't need to 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 be agreeing with me but i think that's that is something that really makes me challenge the fact that in the current organization of shareholder capitalism these big companies are going to be able to make the transition we want so maybe this is this was not put as bluntly in my presentation but maybe we need to see how to we need to change the status of companies in france we have a law that enables companies to state that they have a, a social mission on top 
and or aside the profitability mission. This has not completely uh, led to change, drastic changes in, in the business models of these companies. But this, this is probably something around benefit corporations, um, a mission for companies that we need to explore because there might be things that are just incompatible with the, 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 the way we seek for profitability in big companies today. Well, maybe because of time, uh, because we're about to finish in about a minute. So uh, I, I just saw one uh, other question in the, in the chat, which I think would be very interesting uh, for you to answer, but uh, try to keep it brief. It's a question from uh, Mina Kaljonen, who says, uh, how do you see the possibilities for the common food policy in the European Union? How uh, will research plays, uh, will play a role there? Uh, and I think that would be a very nice question to uh, to finish up this conversation with. Thank you very much, and I'm sorry for making so long uh, answers. No problem. Very, very it's very interesting. Questions. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I I think it's not new that uh, people advocate for a common food policy. Uh, there is a coalition in Brussels led by Olivier de Scutter, the former rapporteur for food security at the UN, that is leading that is asking for a common food policy. And I think there is a, a question of territories between. DG Agri and the Agri, Agri uh, Council of Ministers and the others, Sanko, DG Sanko, DG Environment. Um, definitely, I see uh, uh, Franz Timmermans taking a lead role in saying, I will not uh, agree with the current uh, reform of the common agricultural policy. The farm to fork strategy is integral to the, the Green Deal, and we need to have that prevail and re-question and challenge the current reform of the common agricultural policy. So I see that there is, I'm just talking again of strategic players, because this needs to be understood that we can't think of science uh, in, um, getting involved in that discussion without understanding that there is this uh, critical uh, um, challenging of power between France Timmermans on one hand and DG Agri and the uh, Agri Commissioner to some extent. I'm, 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 I don't want to overplay the, the personalities, but that's what's happening. And so we need science to, to be aware of that and see how we can, if we think, if the researchers in the community think that what is needed is a common food policy, I think advocating, showing that the farm to fork has a lot of potential is probably also gaining weight for that policy over the common agricultural policy. Okay, thank, thank you so much. And, you know, if we would have been in Brussels by now, I would, uh, you know, have walked up on the stage and given you a nice present. Uh, so I will give you a present digitally, uh, but it will be shipped to you. So you will get it uh, at your home. So that is nice. And thank you so much for your very interesting start of this, uh, this conference. I think it was a very valuable presentation. Thank you very much, and sorry not to have answered all the questions. Thank you very much for the study. No problem at all. And uh, so we will finish up this part now, this plenary uh, talk. So what you can do now is either have a coffee or go back to the uh, lobby for a, a break. Uh, there will be some uh, break activities to keep you energized during the day. Uh, and we will uh, reconvene at... Uh, loop. Uh, I have it on paper somewhere. 11.20 for a nice debate. Uh, so uh, I'll see you in a couple of minutes and uh, enjoy your uh, little break. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.